Guys, I, I'm excited about today. I'm excited about this series. I hope you've been enjoying this workshop we've been in called Fix Yourself First. And I want to encourage you, because uh, if you've missed the last couple of weeks, we don't want you to get confused or behind of what we've been talking about as a church. So we've been talking about the temperaments that each of us have uh, as individuals, that God created us with a specific temperament. Uh, so over the last couple of weeks, we've had these uh, personality profile tests that we have been uh, handing out, and we have several of them back at our information booth uh, in the lobby. If you haven't picked one up, you can also get them online. Uh, but I want to encourage you to pick one of those up, get online, fellowshipgj.com. We also have the book called The Spirit-Controlled Temperament by Tim LaHaye. A lot of the teaching that uh, we've been doing comes directly uh, from this test and from uh, this book that Tim LaHaye wrote and pairing that up right out of Scripture for what we've been looking at when it comes to our personalities. But i got to tell you, it's been real fun. Uh, the last couple of weeks, starting to recognize uh, the personalities of the people around us. And Amelie and I have been doing this when it, when it came to our immediate family with our, our daughters. But we've also been doing this uh, as we look at other relationships that we have real close to us. And just to kind of see the, the, the quirky differences that we have in our family. And then even looking like to my parents and seeing the differences that we have uh, from our family to, to my parents' family. And you got to recognize that, um, you know, we're raised by people who are under certain personalities and certain temperaments, but that doesn't mean that we're going to have all of the exact same qualities, all the same uh, strengths or weaknesses. So we were over at their house just this last Sunday for the football game, and we were joking about the differences in many of our personalities. And as you know, last week, my father mentioned that my mom, uh, she tests as a 30-point melancholy, 7-point phlegmatic. So that means the melancholy traits, that's the perfectionistic traits, the organized traits. I mean, my mom is the type of person who has a label maker, and on her label maker, she has a label that says label maker. You know what I mean? That, that type of an organized person. And we were over at their house, and as we were joking about this, Omni and I, we kind of snuck away from everyone who was watching the football game and, and took some pictures of my mom's house to show you the differences between her personality, her temperament, and ours. So uh, I, she's not here today, so I figured this would be a perfect opportunity to share this with you. But we wanted to just go ahead and show you the type of house I was raised in, a very organized, I mean, 30-point melancholy woman organized home. And I want to show you, so we snuck into her cupboards, and I took a picture of her cupboards. This is what her cupboards look like. That is neat as most grocery stores, you know. What's funny is, it's always been this way. And when I would have friends come over as a teenager, some of my friends would go into the pantry and take one of the cans and just turn it like 90 degrees and leave, and it would drive her nuts. She'd be like, which one of your friends was in my pantry, right? Well, Amelie and I, we're not the melancholy type people. She is a sanguine, and in fact, her, she's kind of a blend of a sanguine melancholy. I am a cleric phlegmatic person. So there's like completely different than this personality. So just to show you the contrast, here's a picture of our cupboard. Yeah, that's for those of us that are normal, you know. I don't live in a grocery store. I also took a picture of my mother's closet while we were there. So look, at, I want you to look how evenly spaced each hanger is with each item of clothing. And just to contrast that, here's our coat closet in our house. <laughs> so there's some differences. There, there really is. So this next picture I want to show you, what's funny about this is I, I knew it would drive my mom nuts. So I went into her closet uh, right after we took these pictures and I took each of her hangers and every other hanger I took it and I pulled it off and turned it around the opposite way and hooked it back on the bar and so there's a picture of it you can see what I did there not really that big of a deal but this is what makes this so funny I didn't take this picture the next morning at 7 a.m. my mom texts me this picture it says stop messing with my stuff <laughs> there's a huge difference right well, it's really fun to recognize the differences in our, in our different personalities, but have you ever noticed, though, that sometimes it can be hard to deal with when we start seeing how different someone else is than we are? Like, how many of you would say when it comes to being married, you and your spouse are like complete opposite temperaments? Anyone? That's Omelie and I, and i got to pause for just a moment and tell you, on Friday, we just celebrated our 16-year anniversary, and we're very pumped about that. 
I love my bride. She has to put up with a lot. You'll see today in this service, but she puts up with a lot, and I'm so thankful for her. I know that we're rookies compared to many of you in this room, but we're just really thankful for that. But when it comes to her and I, we are complete different temperaments as well. I don't know that you can get on further ends of the spectrum than being a sanguine melancholy to being a cleric phlegmat like who I am. Now, she's a sanguine melancholy, but she's really a sanguine. Sanguine, 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 sanguine. She's a people person. She's always the life of the party. She's, she's ready to throw a party any time. Like, like, are we going to go somewhere? Are there people there? Certainly there's people there, right? Can we bring people with us when we go there? And it'll be more of a party. That's the type of woman I am married. Now, the thing is, she has a blended personality with a melancholy trait. So she has enough melancholy temperament to where she will be organized about certain things. Like, for instance... She will sit down at the kitchen table with my daughters and she'll pull out a a laptop and she'll get a bunch of newspapers and she'll get a a piece of paper to make a list. And what they will do is they will together make a plan of how we're going to attack our groceries for the day. Uh, so she will, she will get online, she'll have the girls start cutting out all these different coupons over here, and she's getting on looking at where all the different sales are at this store, the different sales at this store. So she's got a list that we're going to go to this store first because we can get these things with this amount off, and with these coupons we can put them over here and we'll do that, and then we're going to go to this store over here. She's got this whole huge plan. That's her melancholy side. But then we get to the store, and the sanguine takes back over to the point to where I say, hey, babe, where's the list? And she goes, I don't know, I can't find it. That's the woman I married. I I love her. But I think every one of us, we'd look at our own personalities and go, okay, so we've got some strengths that we bring to the table, but unfortunately there's some weaknesses we bring as well. And I think that uh, as I share with you some of my weaknesses today, uh, you'll probably feel bad for my wife and you'll probably want to start praying for her. And I encourage you to do so because as I was reading in Tim LaHaye's book that talks about all these different temperament blends, I, I read about my strengths and I read about my weaknesses. And this is what he says about the cleric, cleric phlegmat personality. He says this, this is me, okay? No one can be more bullheadedly stubborn than the cleric phlegmatic. <laughs> Repentance or the acknowledgement of a mistake is not easy for them. Consequently, they try to make it up to those that they have wronged without really facing their mistakes. Can we just stop and pray for my wife for a moment? (laughs) You know, what's interesting is I know this about my own personality. In fact, I, I see it and I struggle with it a lot because I know I can be bullheaded. I know I can be stubborn. I know I, I take things way too far. I know when I, uh, when I should apologize and I don't. And it's funny because I'm studying this stuff. And just two weeks ago, uh, Amelie and I were working on a personal project at our house together. And, and she, she had left and she had an idea about it. But I had already had in my mind, like the, my set plan, this is how I'm going to attack this project. This is what we're going to do. And she calls me up on the phone. She says, Dan, I was thinking about this project and I think we should do this or that or this. I'm like, don't mess with my plan, right? So my stubborn, my bullheadedly stubborn head gets right in the way and I start going, no, we're going to do it this way. I already told you we're doing it this way. Don't get in my way. We're going to do it. So that, that's it. That's final. It's like, gosh, and, and we, we hung up the phone. And a couple minutes later, I'm sitting there going, here, I've been reading about my weaknesses. I've been reading about, you know, uh, knowing when I'm wrong and, and not apologizing. Why did I do that? First off, getting on the phone with your wife and just arguing with her and barking at her, for, that's stupid, you know. I mean, nothing good is going to come out of this. So I'm going, i, I got to fix this. So I, I called her up, and, and sheepishly, I'm like, babe, I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't know. I was just being bullheaded. I didn't even listen to what you had to say, and I'm sorry. So, so tell me again what you were thinking. And it's funny because later she told me that from her side of it, she gets off the phone with me, and she's thinking, like, how could he be so bullheaded? Why would he not just listen to me? And then a couple seconds later, the phone rings, and there I'm going, babe, I'm sorry. And I think that that's one of the things that... Uh, we've had to do and had to learn in our marriage is I've had to become someone who apologizes a lot because I have a lot that I need to apologize for on a regular basis. But I, I get into these situations where I'm thinking, you know what, I'm teaching this stuff. I'm, I, I'm trying to be a pastor, trying to be a good father. And it's like, I decide, you know what, I'm not going to be bullheaded anymore. I'm not going to be stubborn anymore. And then the very thing I decide I'm not going to do is what I end up doing. There's a 
passage of scripture that I read regularly. It's one I go back to several times a month, and it's Romans chapter 7. I love this because it's a struggle that Paul is being honest about, and when he's being honest about it, I, I, I feel like, you know what, that's my problem. I struggle the same way. I feel like that's exactly what I deal with. And in Romans 7, I want to go ahead and just read it to you. Um, this is Paul's words. Verse 15, he says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I, if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. So he's, he's having this battle, and he's allowing us to see what's going on in his mind here. He's like, I know I've got bad sin behaviors, and I know I've got temperament problems, and I know I've got so many things that are wrong with me, and I just thought, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then he goes, but I, I realize... I go back and do those exact things that I commit to saying I'm not going to do those things anymore. Verse 23 or 21 says, I've discovered this principle in life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all of my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then verse 25, he says, thank God the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Man, I love that scripture. I love it because I feel that way. And I don't know if you feel this way in your own life, but I can tell it's a struggle I deal with a lot. When I say, you know what, I'm not going to be bullheaded anymore. I'm not going to be stubborn anymore. And then I find myself being bullheadedly stubborn about not being bullheadedly stubborn. It's like I'm just going down the same cycle, the same spiral. I want to jump into this, but before we do, I just want to invite you to pray with me. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to come into this place and teach us. Now, God, we love you so much. And... uh I don't want to get in the way of what you want to speak into each of us today, but I pray instead that your Holy Spirit would fill me right now uh, with a fresh anointing to be able to teach your word and that, God, uh, you would speak to us, that you comfort us, you change us, you convict us, God, like only you can. Help us understand how you've made us and then help us understand our reliance and our need for you. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know... I do this where I recognize a sin or I recognize a temperament where I say, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. And just like uh, I agreed to going, I- I'm not going to be bullheadedly stubborn anymore, especially when it comes to arguing with my wife. There's no point in it. And then in my determination to not be bullheadedly stubborn, I just get bullheadedly stubborn about being bullheadedly stubborn. And, and I-, I realize like, I don't feel like I'm getting any better at this. I feel like I'm just struggling with the same old stuff, the same old problems. And and being in a family where I'm raising uh, two wonderful daughters, I feel like there's many times when when maybe I'm the one that should be put in the timeout. I'm, I'm probably the one that needs some discipline and some punishment here because I realize it's, it's my behavior, it's my attitudes that can be wrong. And I feel like for every one of us in this room, if we were to be honest for just a moment, over the last couple of weeks as we've taken a look at our temperaments and we've looked at our strengths, really easy to grab onto the strengths and say, you know what, I'm a cleric, I love being a cleric, I, that means I, I'm a leader, I'm going to get stuff done. Like We all could grab onto our, the strengths of our own temperament and say that's something I love, but it's really hard sometimes for us to, to realize that, that our weaknesses are something that we have to own up to as well. So I look at my own problems and decide, you know what, I'm just not going to do that anymore. And, and, and there's people around me who love me, who understand this struggle that I deal with, and my wife is one of them, who, who, who will continually remind me of a scripture that helps me in these times when I'm just thinking, I'm just going to do better at this. I mean, this is a guy thing. Guys in this room, we all get into this attitude, but I'm just going to do better at that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit doing that. I'm going to fix this. I've just got to get stronger and better. And she reminds me of this verse that, that God speaks to us that can just comfort us in our human condition there. And it's found in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. And this verse says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. 
Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. This verse is telling us, God is speaking to us, and he's saying, there are things that we're going to face in life, and there are changes that you're going to face in life, and and problems you're going to deal with in life that you can't be tough enough to just fix on your own. I can't just get the might or the strength or the power to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. He's saying there's certain things even about your temperament you can't change on your own. The only way you're going to change is by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You know, that takes a lot of pressure off of someone like me who, who I just want to fix it. I just, I, I can't bring the bad side of me to the table anymore. I got to bring the good side. And he's saying, listen, it's not going to work with you just trying to be tough about this. You're going to have to submit yourself to me and I can change you. It's my spirit that can change you. And the Bible tells us how. The Bible says that there's an evidence that occurs in each one of our lives when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. When we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he's our Savior and our Lord, we've asked him to forgive us for our sins, he sends us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can lead us. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, the Bible says that there's evidence of that called the fruit of the Spirit. And you should be able to look at someone's life and say, well, if they're exhibiting these fruits, it's very evident they're being led by the Spirit. Because these are things, you can't fake these things. You can try for a short period of time, but it will never work. And the fruit of the Spirit is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When you look at that list, I mean... That's something I think every one of us in this room, we wish we had more of that. I wish I was a more loving person. I wish I had more joy in my life. I wish I had more peace. I wish I had more patience. We can go down that list. For every one of us in this room, these are things that we really want, but we can't fake it. See, in contrast to this, though, there are other things that you and I bring to the table when it comes to our relationships that don't look anything like this. We all walk around with our weaknesses, our natural weaknesses, because of our temperament. So I want to just break it down and let's, let's get on the same page and make sure we're all being honest here this morning. So I want to start off and just look at these weaknesses today. So first, for everyone to be honest in here, how many of you would say uh, you're the sanguine personality? If you're the sanguine personality, raise your hand really high. Okay, this is the people person, the popular personality, okay? You just raise your hand, you're probably going to wish you didn't right now because now we're going to look at your weaknesses These are the weaknesses of the sanguine. Uh, A sanguine's weaknesses can be that they're restless, they're weak-willed, they're egotistical, they're emotional, they're unstable, okay? Emotionally unstable even. Wow. (laughs) So these these are things that naturally in your temperament, these are things that you have to deal with. I mean, we call this our, our human nature, our sinful nature. These are things that will just rise up in the sanguine personality. Let, let's take a look at clerics. How many of you in this room, clerics? Raise your hand high. Clerics, here, here's your list right here. Hot-tempered, cruel, impetuous, self-sufficient. Th- these are the weaknesses I carry. This is, could be the bull-headed uh, uh, stubborn side of me that comes out. That's the choleric weaknesses. Uh, the next one's melancholy. How many of you are melancholy? All right. These are melancholy weaknesses right here. You can be self-centered, pessimistic, moody, revengeful. This is a happy list, right? <laughs> Don't worry, flagmats. We're getting you right now. If you're a flagmat, raise your hand. Thank you for that. I know that was difficult. <laughs> The phlegmatic personality can be slow and lazy, teasing, selfish, stubborn, or indecisive. Now, here's the truth about this list. I mean, we all want to, you know, we're, we're proud about our strengths, but we read this list and we think, no, nah, that's not me. I don't, I, I don't think about it. But the person sitting next to you can see those things in you, okay? Let's just be honest. We, we, we can recognize that these are strengths and weaknesses that we all face. And and with these weaknesses, the person sitting next to you knows that you struggle with these different weaknesses. This is just part of our human nature. So let me ask you this. Let's not talk about you for a second. Let's talk about the person sitting next to you. Think about their weaknesses for a moment. And in contrast to their weaknesses, let's put the fruit of the Spirit back up here. 
In contrast to, their, uh, to those weaknesses, do you wish that that person sitting next to you, instead of the weaknesses we just read, instead of being stubborn or indecisive or, or egotistical, instead of that, do you wish that when you interacted with them they were more loving, more joyful, they had more peace, they had more patience, they had more kindness? Now think for a moment. If you allow the Holy Spirit to lead your life, it doesn't just affect you. It, it doesn't just make your life better. It makes the person sitting next to you, it makes their life better. And it makes your kid's life better. And your co-worker's life better. It makes your boss's life better. It affects everyone that you come in contact with on a daily basis. And, and you might look at your list of weaknesses and go, wait, wait a minute, those are pretty ugly. They're pretty difficult. But for every weakness that we covered, there, there's, there's spiritual fruit that covers that weakness. And it doesn't matter what it is. You could pick anything out and go, you know what, I, I feel like I can be pessimistic or moody. And, and then you look at the fruit of the Spirit and see, wait a minute, God could give me joy and peace and, and patience and kindness. I mean, those things so overpower any bit of pessimism or moodiness. I mean, when we look at our lives, we can see that, you know what, my life would be so much better if I had a life that what I was exhibiting was strengths of my character, but then the fruit of the Spirit in place of my weaknesses. But how do we do that? You know, how, how do we get to living the type of a life where we're not always just putting our negative side and our weaknesses out into our relationships and into our family, but instead we're bringing the fruit of the Spirit. There was an illustration that um, was shared with me when I was a teenager. We were in a teenage service, and, and, the, and the pastor was teaching. He brought a television out onto the stage, and, and of course, we all know what a television is. He says, you see this, you recognize this television. Uh, he said, if you were to bring this television to the other side of the world, to a tribe of people who have never seen a television before, they would look at it, and they would say, wow, it's a piece of plastic with glass on the front. It's heavy, it's cumbersome. What am I supposed to do with that? Because they don't know the potential of what could happen when it's hooked up to a power source. And then the pastor, he, he took a plug out and he, he, he plugged in the television and he said, the whole, your whole perspective on this television just changed because now you see its potential. Now you see what it's capable of doing. It is so much more than just a heavy piece of plastic and glass. This, this can communicate. It can show pictures. It can tell stories. There's so much uh, potential in this television. And he started explaining to us that every one of us have to be plugged into a power source. Because if we're not plugged into a power source, I mean, all, all you get is the weak side of us and, and, and the cumbersome side of our life and the difficult side of our life. But if you want to see the potential and you want to see the good that can happen in your life, you have to be plugged into a power source. And the Bible says that the power source for those of us that have a relationship with God is his Holy Spirit. That through a relationship with Jesus, we lean into him, we stay plugged into him, and our lives can be changed in such a wonderful way, not just for us, but for the people around us. And Jesus says this. He explains to a group of people who have never seen the TV before. He's talking to them uh, with an, an agricultural analogy, and he says this in John 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. He's saying, you've got to understand this. I'm the vine. Think of a vineyard. I'm the vine. And any branch that is connected to me, they're going to produce fruit. But the Bible says they will bear fruit. And then he goes on and says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You might be in here today and go, well, wait a minute, I, I think I can do some things. But Jesus is saying, no, no, you can't. You've got to understand this, that in your life with your potential, with what he's created you to do, if you're plugged into him, you can do so much. But apart from him, he says you can do nothing. Think about a branch when it's cut away from a vine. What happens? The branch dies, right? So the Bible here, Jesus says you will bear fruit. 
bear fruit. Well, now, bearing fruit is different than just manufacturing fruit or producing fruit uh, because the production of fruit is different than bearing. Bearing means to hold on to or to sustain or be able to carry the weight of that fruit. So a vine that can carry fruit, doesn't matter if the wind's blowing, it doesn't matter if there's an earthquake, any sort of shaking, that fruit stays there. And Jesus uses this word, and it's very powerful for us to understand. He says, when you're remaining in me, you're connected to me, you're going to be able to bear fruit, hold on to that fruit. Because I think for a short, uh, a short period of time, we can try to hold on to our fruit. For a short period of time, you can try to be patient. right? You can try to be kind. But we decide, I'm going to be patient, I'm going to be kind today. And then you go to the office and you run into that person. And you're thinking, man, this should have been easy, but I didn't know I was going to run into him today. Like, I, now I've got to try to be kind and he's going to be shaking my fruit. You know, like... I, you're messing this up for me. And see, we're going to go through difficult things and be around difficult people that shake our fruit. And you might go, wait a minute, uh, I'm trying to be a good mom. I'm trying to be a good father, but my kids shake my fruit. Like, I'm at work, I'm great all day long. I go pick them up from school. They're fighting on the way home from school. By the time I get home, it's like I roll the windows down and throw all my fruit out the window. <laughs> Daddy's not patient anymore, Right? And see, what Jesus is saying here is he's going, if you remain in me, you know, you stay connected to me. And as we're connected together, not only are you going to produce spiritual fruit, and not only are you going to have joy and love and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, not only will these be in your life, they can sustain. And you can hold on to them even when you go through difficult times and difficult people. So how do we have the type of life where we remain in Jesus? We stay close to them. We stay tied into them there so we can continually present our best to those people that are around us in our lives and not just the weaknesses. It's interesting because I'm going to jump around to a couple different scriptures here uh, because we're going to be in Romans, but I'm going to jump to Ephesians real quickly because Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 was teaching people what it looks like to be someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and he's saying, you know what, there are certain things you should do. You, you probably shouldn't, uh, you got to watch the words that are coming out of your mouth. You should encourage one another, uh, sing songs together and to one another and all this sort of stuff. But right in the middle of all of this teaching that, that Paul has in Ephesians chapter chapter 5, on the, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he, he throws something in there that at first glance you're like, that is way out of place. Why does he even say that? And it's Ephesians 5.18. He says this. He says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, which just means, you know, uh, leading to bad decisions, making uh, bad choices that hurt you and other people around you. Do not be, get drunk off wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Wait a minute, here he is talking about the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit, and now all of a sudden he's talking about, wait, wait Paul, are you talking about how many glasses of wine I, I can have on a Friday night? What, what are we talking about here? And I think that it's important for us to pause for a moment and see why does he make this comparison, and why does he make this contrast here between, between drunkenness and being filled with the Holy Spirit? And I think it's something that if we pause for a moment, might open your eyes a little bit to what he's trying to tell us. And, and if we pause, we see that every person he was talking to in that culture, and every person in this room now, knows how does a person get drunk? Well, a person gets drunk by, by drinking wine and keep drinking and keep drinking and keep drinking and keep drinking. you got to keep drinking wine if you're going to get drunk. And if you want to stop being drunk, you got to stop drinking wine. And eventually it will wear off. And you might think, well, no, I know some people, you don't have to keep drinking. Well, uh, there's much stronger and nicer alcohols now in our culture than what Paul was talking about in his time. The alcohols were very weak at the time. So if a person decided to go to a party and get drunk, they would be drinking a very weak wine and they would drink for hours and hours and hours and hours. So Paul's saying, how do you get drunk? You keep drinking wine. Then he makes this contrast and this comparison. In the same way, how does a person get filled with the Holy Spirit? you got to keep drinking of the Holy Spirit. 
You've got to keep going back to the Holy Spirit. Keep allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. It's a continual thing. Because in the same way where if a person stops drinking wine, it'll wear off. If you stop going back to the Holy Spirit and you stop leaning into God, eventually the fruit of the Spirit is going to start wearing off in your own life. So what is Paul telling us here in Ephesians? He's saying that this is a continual thing first off. I mean, it's not good enough to just go to church on Sunday and think that that's going to be enough, that's going to be what changes your walk and changes your temperament and allows the Holy Spirit to lead your life. He's saying that's, that's a great shot in the arm. It's a great way for us to encourage one another at the beginning of our week, and it's something that we're told to do as followers of Christ. But, but what he's saying here is you've got to keep going back and on a Monday morning lean into God and say, I, I, I need some of your Holy Spirit's guidance today. So God, talk to me today. Fill me up today. And we worship him and we lean into him every day. It's a continual thing. But I think what so many of us do as Christians, unfortunately, is is we get this all messed up where instead of leaning into God, we try to get better at our lives by just not doing the wrong thing. And we, we just focus on, like, I'm going to just try not to sin. I'm going to try to not mess up. And, and I'm going to just not be bullheaded today. Or I'm not going uh, to do this problem or that problem. And, and we get so confused by this. But Paul then later, in Romans chapter 8, tells us about this problem. He says, verse 5, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Okay, so... Their mind is wrapped around sinful things. So those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Man, I want a lot more life and peace in my life. But I think we get this backwards. Because we think... If, if I'm not going to sin, I need to focus on not sinning. And, and you can go into a pattern of going, you know what, tomorrow, I, I'm not going to smoke a cigarette tomorrow. And, and, and I'm not going to get on that website, I'm not going to look at any pornography tomorrow, or I'm not going to bring this bad temperament weakness to the table in my meeting tomorrow. So we get up, and if you're focused on the sin, I'm not going to commit this sin, then what are you thinking about at 9 o'clock in the morning? I'm not going to have that cigarette. I'm not going to have that cigarette. It's 9.05 now, I'm not going to have that cigarette. It's 9.10, not going to have that cigarette. Or now it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm not going to get on that website. I'm not going to get on that website because I know I might see that if I get on that website. What is happening to my mind? My mind is focused on the sin. This is a lesson we learned in kindergarten when, when the teacher says, don't think about an elephant class, and every kid in class goes, I'm thinking about an elephant. <laughs> what, are, what are you allowing to dominate your mind? Paul's saying that's not how you do it as a follower of Christ. You don't go through life trying not to sin. You don't go through life focusing on what not to do. You go through life focusing on what's going to please the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus want me to do? And this this flips the whole thing upside down. I can tell you, this became evident to me in my life, and I experienced this the first time when I began serving in children's ministry. Because up until serving in children's ministry, my Christian walk basically looked like I'd sin, I'd make mistakes, I'd pray and apologize and try not to sin again. And that was basically the extent of my spiritual growth. And then once I started working in children's ministry, all these kids started asking me questions. And they say, well, the Bible story said this. What, what does God mean by that? And, and all of a sudden I realized, I don't know, so I need to go study. And I, and I began focusing on serving these kids and focusing on studying and understanding God's word more. And as I did this, like now my mind, my thoughts are controlled by what's pleasing to the Spirit. Because I'm thinking, when I get back in there on Sunday, that kid's going to ask me this question again. And God, would you answer me so I know? Where is it in Scripture that... that I could help this person as I began to do that. Then I could start to look back and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. A a lot of these problems, these sins, these struggles that I've dealt with in my life, like they're not even on the radar right now. Because now something's flipped and what my mind is dominated by is what pleases the Holy Spirit. And I'm not thinking just don't do that anymore. Now don't get me wrong. 
I still have temptations, and I still had temptations when this transition took place in my life. But what was happening is instead of that being the focus of my attention, the focus of my attention is now, God, what do you want me to do? I want to lean into you. What, what, what should I do today? What should I read today? Who should I help today? How, God, can you use me today? And in doing so, my whole life began to turn around. Now, I'm not for a second going to act like I've got any of this all together, but I, I can just tell you from my own experience, my, my struggles with sin, my struggles with the weakness of my personality, being bullheaded, being stubborn, all of these struggles, if I go into my life going, I'm just not going to do that anymore, I find myself frustrated, I find myself in a pattern where I do it over and over and over again, but it's the times of my life when I just get up and go, God, what do you want me to do today? That that stuff starts to fade off. And then the version of me that my family gets looks a lot more like Galatians 5 instead of just a bullheaded, stubborn, power-tripping choleric. <laughs> See, I think that's what all of us in this room want, is we want to be able to bring the best version of ourselves into any room that we come into. And I, I think that for a lot of us in this room, the, the melancholy specifically would love just like a list. Tell me five things. What are five points I should do? And that's going to make this all better. But, but Paul, as he spoke to the, the group in Rome, as he spoke to the group in Ephesus, he didn't give a five-point sermon. He basically said all this to sum it up with just us as followers of Christ understanding this is all about greater intimacy with God. It's all about us recognizing he's the vine and we're the branches. If we're in him, if we're connected to him, we're going to bear fruit. We're going to be people that resemble him. But as soon as we disconnect ourselves, we're not going to look like him anymore. So I think what I'd like to do in closing today is just ask every person in this room to stand with me and, and, and bow your heads and close your eyes. And with no one looking around, as we're standing getting ready to end this message, I think that there might be people in this room today that say, you know what, I need some changes in my life, but you're talking about God leading you, the Holy Spirit and all that. And I don't even think I've ever started a relationship with God. I, I don't even know if I have a relationship with Jesus. Well, very clearly and quickly, I just want to explain to you how to have a relationship with Jesus. Again, no one looking around, just listening to the words of God. As we read here in Romans still, we see Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible calls it sin. It's missing the mark. Every one of us have made mistakes, and that separates us from God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So because we've sinned, what you and I all deserve is we deserve death. Physical death, spiritual death, we deserve to be separate from God. But God gives us a promise here. There's a free gift, and we get this free gift through Jesus Christ. And, he, and then we understand, he tells us, this is how you know you can be saved. This is how you know you can go to heaven. This is how you can know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. I believe there's people in this room right now that as you hear these words, you feel something on the inside going, that, that's me. I've never done this before. I've never asked Jesus into my heart. I've never made him the Lord of my life. I've never believed in him before. And if that's you, I want the opportunity to pray for you today. Today could be a day where you can nail it down and know without a doubt you're tied into Jesus Christ. You're tied into God. So with no one looking around, if that's you today and you know you need to pray a prayer and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, I want to invite you to just raise your hand so I can pray with you. Raise it high so I can see it. Thank you. I see all your hands. It takes courage and boldness to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. For all of you that just raised your hand, the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I want us as a church right now to pray a prayer. And I'm going to lead you in this prayer where I pray and you repeat after me. And I want everyone to do this so no one feels left out. And as I do this, if you just raise your hand and you need to pray this prayer, I want you uh, to mean these words and speak them out and believe them. And let's ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. So let's pray right now. Dear Jesus, 
I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross for me and paid the price for my sins. And I believe you rose again and can give me a home forever in heaven. So I believe you are Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of my sins and become my master. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's a lot of people that just put your hands up. I want to encourage you, if that was your first time, we want to celebrate with you. Put your hand back up so we can celebrate with you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Awesome. Well, now for the rest of us, um, before we dismiss right now, I want to pray one more prayer and just ask the Holy Spirit to lead us so that when we go out into the world, we're not bringing our, our ugly, weak side of our temperament, but we're bringing the fruit of the Spirit uh, into every room that we come into. So if that's you, if you need some change, put your hands up in the air and let's pray and ask God right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come before you because of what Jesus has done for us. And we pray right now that you would help us, that you would change us. God, we recognize we need more of you. We need to be tied into you. And we pray right now that your Holy Spirit would just come and invade us, come into our lives in such a powerful way to where there would be evidence God, of your love and your fruit in our lives. So help us today. Help us be better mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, co-workers. God, every relationship that we have, we pray that you would just come and help us be more effective in showing your love. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's give them a shout of praise before we go today.